Welcome to the Busy Latter-day Saint, where righteous desires and living life comes together. Here, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints discuss their challenges and successes in studying the scriptures. I'm your host, Richard Bernard. The music for this program is by Marvin Goldstein and used with his permission. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I encourage you to leave a comment regarding this episode or the podcast in general. To leave a comment, go to love the podcast. That's all one word, lovethepodcast.com forward slash B as in boy LDS. Again, lovethepodcast.com forward slash BLDS. Or you can click on the link in the show notes. My guest today is Norman Hill, author and past mission president. Norm's latest book, What They Didn't Teach You at the MTC, was released in mid March and is available through Cedar Fort and Amazon. Norm shares with us his challenges serving in West Africa and why he was led to encourage a different approach to studying the scriptures among his missionaries. Now, here's Norm. Norm, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. The weather is clear and uh, sunny in St. George, but it's only going to hit the 40s, upper 40s today. Yeah, St. George. Now, did you grow up in that area? I did not. I grew up uh, north of Ogden, a little town called Clinton, Utah. But I've lived uh, most of my life in Texas, almost uh, 30 years, and then 12 years in New Orleans, and almost eight years in West Africa. Wow. Well, why did you go down to St. George where it gets 150 degrees in the summertime? Uh, I actually don't mind it in the, the middle of the summer. I ride my bike almost every day. And I can get 11 months of cycling on the terrific bike paths of St. George throughout the whole year. Okay. Well, the, the heat obviously doesn't bother you. Hey, I uh, told you, uh, <laughs> West Africa, South Louisiana, and East Texas, they're all pretty hot. So <laughs> I, I think I've gotten used to it, Richard. <laughs> well, it looks like it. What I know, my in-laws live down in St. George. In fact, we have our... Our, um, my brother-in-law and his wife are building a home in St. George. It's always a nice um, stop-off point on the way to California. <laughs> but in St. George, people actually put air conditioners in their garage. It, it can get hot. Yeah. Uh, you know, the story attributed to uh, uh, famously to St. George um if I had a house in St. George and a house in hell, I'd sell the one in hell, St. George and live in hell. It can be pretty hot here. <laughs> yeah, it can. But, you know, it's a beautiful area also. It's very beautiful. Love the red rocks. Yes, uh, yeah, the, the red. The I've red... only been here four years, but have grown to love and appreciate it. Yeah, the red rocks are absolutely beautiful. Well, you grew up in Clinton. I've actually driven through there. It's a pretty small town, if I remember right. Um, how did your parents, what influence did they have on your life? Oh, like most children, my parents uh, had enormous influence. Um, so when I was a boy, there was one town in our town, sorry, there was one ward in our town, and I saw it uh, split into two when I was mm, nine or so. And now there's three stakes. So it's grown tremendously. On my mother's side, the child side of the family, they helped settle Clinton. And I have always appreciated that heritage. Um, my, my grandfather was a farmer there. I grew up doing farm work. It was one of the pivotal influences in my life. My dad, his mother is a Sessions. And Peregrine Sessions uh, settled Bountiful. Originally, it was called Sessions Settlement. And I've often said most of my relatives still live uh, in the Wasatch Front area and for a time were mostly in Davis County. And I said, yeah, one of my ancestors, Peregrine Sessions, was the first pioneer to leave Salt Lake and establish a settlement, Sessions Settlement, now Bountiful. And most of my relatives still live there. I took the opposite route, grew up with that very supportive environment and chose to live in 
Texas, Louisiana, and West Africa for the chance to stretch my wings and share things that were important to me and uh, always relied on that growing up heritage that I had. Well, now, you were in Texas. Was that because of your occupation? It is. I worked for ExxonMobil for 30 years and for Reliant Energy for six. I was the manager of training and development, among other positions with ExxonMobil. I was a regional human resource manager as well. And with Reliant Energy, I was the vice president of human resources. So it was work that took me to Texas. Okay. And what got you to New Orleans? Uh, same thing. New Orleans uh, was the center of the offshore operations. And I went there as a, first a human resource staff and eventually became the human resource manager for the eastern and offshore divisions for ExxonMobil. At, at one point in time, those divisions uh, were actually bigger than Ford Motor Company. And things have changed a bit as uh, businesses evolve, but it was a great experience, great time uh, to live there. I actually lived there twice and enjoyed Mardi Gras and the chance to see uh, really a different, very different environment than Clinton, Utah. Uh, New Orleans is primarily Catholic. As a city, it's primarily black. As an area, it's relies on tourism and the energy industry at the time. None of that are characteristic of Clinton, Utah, which is just a nice, comfortable farm community when, when I grew up. Yeah, that would be very different. Were you there in New Orleans when any hurricanes? Yeah, I actually was on an offshore platform when Hurricane Bob came through in uh, at one point in the 80s. It was a low-grade hurricane. I wasn't there during Katrina, um, but, you know, hurricanes come through the area either in Texas or Louisiana periodically. So we missed the terrible ones, but uh, did see the effects of hurricanes during some of the time that we lived there. All right. Now you said West Texas, correct? Uh, East Texas. Oh, East Texas. So East Texas. West Africa, South Louisiana. Okay, so East Texas, what town were you in? Houston. Oh, Houston, Houston. okay. All right. Tiny woods of East Texas is what right. local people say. Well, now, Houston. in all this moving around, what about children? How many children do you have? We have four adult children, um, and uh, it's been a great blessing in my life. We have a grandchild on the way that will make 16, and they live... At one point, before our mission, uh, our mission called to the Ghana Accra West Mission, all our kids were in Texas. Now none of them are. They're in uh, Illinois, Colorado, one in Salt Lake, and one just relocated to Kona, Hawaii. Oh, wow. Well, you have a nice place to go visit. Yeah, we haven't been there yet. He's just uh, arrived a few weeks ago. Uh, accepted a position there in the hospital. He's an emergency room physician, and we're looking forward to vacationing there off. When my oldest son lived in Puerto Rico, we went there uh, a couple of times a year. We always knew where we were going to holiday as a family to go see him. Well, now, you kept talking about Africa. You served as a mission president there. I did. I first went to Africa in 2001, working for ExxonMobil, and worked on various projects in Angola, Chad, Cameroon, uh, Nigeria, and uh, eventually lived in Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria, for five years, working for ExxonMobil. Um, and then I returned, worked another year in Houston, and was called on a mission to the Ghana Accra West Mission and served there from 2013 to 2016. And you served as mission president. I was, yes. yep, mission president there. Yeah. How many missionaries did you have? When we started, we had about 100, but that was because we were a division from another mission, and 
Uh, eventually, I think we probably averaged about 165. Of our missionaries, about 50% were North Americans, Utah, Idaho, California, Arizona. Uh, about 40% were Africans from throughout the continent. And about 10% were Polynesian, were Islanders. At one point, we had missionaries from 26 different countries. And we would say, we have a many United Nations here, just in our mission with the diversity of countries that are represented in our mission. There's a tremendous growth there, isn't there, as far as uh, membership in the church, or conversions? The church is growing tremendously in West Africa. And what a terrific story in Nigeria and in Ghana. Um, for some number of years before the revelation on the priesthood, there were no missionaries assigned to West Africa. And yet there were informal, that's the term that's used, informal branches that were throughout Nigeria and Ghana, uh, literally thousands of people who were attending um, informal branches of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, going back to the 1960s. And with the revelation, two couples were sent to Ghana and to Nigeria to investigate the uh, Elder and Sister Maybe and Elder and Sister Cannon. And they uh, baptized within months hundreds and hundreds of people. And the church has grown tremendously since that period of time. There's uh, people say, even non-members of the church, religion is in the air in West Africa. People are just very open to talk about religion. It's very easy to talk about religion in Ghana. It's about 60 percent uh, Christian, about 30 percent Muslim, about 10 percent nativistic, uh, something of a nature worship. But regardless of people's religious persuasion, they're very open to talk about faith and their beliefs and to listen to what our members of our church have to say, whether they're formal missionaries or everyday missionaries. Well, I'm I've always been amazed that um, these unofficial units would exist and not having the priesthood and everything it required tremendous faith from these people. It did. Uh, and at various times, people traveling through the area would drop off materials occasionally. There were materials that were sent to these groups. I, I think... Uh, Richard, in particular, part of the faith is um, after the church was formally organized uh, and people began to pay tithing, they discovered that there was no paid ministry. And, and yet almost everyone who had been previously either a minister or a teacher or a, a, a pianist um, who now went from a paid to a voluntary position, remained with the church, uh, accepted the changes, and found other kind of work. That's a tremendous story as well. Yes. Faith and commitment. Yeah, ab absolutely. Well, um, moving on here, uh, you are also an author. I thought you were an author of just one recent book, but that is not the case. You've written quite a few books. I have. I've written two previous books that Bookcraft, now part of Deseret Book, published. 
uh, and then I've written four books for the general business audience that McGraw Hill, uh, Addison Wesley, uh, a group called Thompson Learning uh, published. McGraw Hill published two business books and the others each one. And, and then I've written several articles for the Ensign, New Era, and Liahona uh, as well. So I've, I've, uh, it, I've had a chance to write. It's, it's as much for me to coalesce my thoughts, try to keep me on the straight and narrow, uh, and hopefully to share some insights that will be useful as part of a dialogue. I always enjoy talking to people, not just about what I've written, but about ideas that will be helpful, especially in sharing the gospel and deepening our faith. Well, now, am I correct? Um, one of the books you've written was a novel. No, haven't written a novel. Okay, uh, then there's a there's another Norman Hill out there <laughs> that has. <laughs> yeah, there's actually uh, every once in a while people will say, "I saw a citation uh, from you," and uh, it, it ranges from there's a, a British medical researcher to. Uh, uh, others who just write on various topics, but um, I'm not the only Norman Hill out there, as much as I'd like to think that I'm unique. <laughs> and every once in a while, people will say to me, I saw somebody who looked like they could be you, only they were younger. And I said, well, maybe it was me when I was younger. <laughs> and every once in a while, I'll also say, well, you know, the Lord thought this was just a good, common, ordinary face. Let's make a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I haven't written uh, any any uh, novels or nonfiction. Okay. Well, now, your recent book, what's the title of it? What They Don't Teach You at the MTC. Okay. So uh, my, my goal was to share experiences. I served as a counselor to two mission presidents in Texas, in the Texas-Houston mission. And then, in addition to the Ghana Accra West mission, for a period of time, uh, I also presided over the Sierra Leone Freetown mission. There was a pandemic that was localized to West Africa, Ebola. And for 15 months, I presided over that mission as well. So I've, I've had a fair number of experiences in the U.S., uh, elsewhere, and wanted to share some of those as well as some of the principles that are described in Preach My Gospel, but not always given a practical application. So I, I wanted a book that would be universal, uh, apply regardless of a mission, would take Preach My Gospel as a given, as a foundation, and then go from there with applications. And that's what I've tried to do with this book. All right. Well, you and I do have something in common. We've both published with uh, Cedar Fort, and that's where your book is from, your most recent book anyway. Now, um, what are one or two th points from that book that missionaries should know? Um, it's hard to limit to one or two, Richard, but I'll do my best. So uh, one of the unique things today, of course, is proselyting virtually. Many missionaries are on lockdown, or at least they have restrictions, some by the mission president or the church, others by governments. And, and so they've had to develop creative ways to use social media. First time, really, uh, in the history of the church that missionaries have had this kind of challenge. So they've responded enormously well, creative, innovative ideas, some perhaps more so than others. I've seen uh, a few Facebook posts that were um, not as inspiring as others, but some really creative things that are happening. And I've captured some of those. I've interviewed a fair number of missionaries, and I've, I have a chapter on uh, how to be a virtual missionary, how to proselyte during the pandemic. A second kind of, uh, I, I think, innovative approach is I've taken Preach My Gospel and developed, extracted really from it, uh, competencies that are described in Preach My Gospel. Uh, during my career and my job, 
I would do that for ExxonMobil. I would, uh, as part of training programs, look at what competencies, what skills and abilities were important and necessary to be successful in a job, and then first list them and then try to develop training programs around, around them. I've done the same kind of thing with Preach My Gospel. I've gone through it, looked at what uh, the brethren have included as competencies, and, and there's not a simple list. I've had to extract it based on material that's in Preach My Gospel, but I've done so, and then uh, used those competencies, described them in a chapter, and described how missionaries can use them to improve their own skills and abilities. And third, and I'll limit it to three, uh, I served when the church published a booklet called Adjusting to Missionary Life, and it was when the age was lowered from 19 to 18 for young men and 21 to 19 for young women, and uh, it has a number of good ideas on how to adjust to missionary life, again, are somewhat general as any publication from the church has to be in order to fit across the planet, I've taken some of the things that are included in adjusting to missionary life and given practical application to, given examples, and provided ways that missionaries can improve adjusting not only going on a mission, but returning from a mission as well. How to have a, a smooth transition back after you've served your mission. Well, now, I haven't been able to read the book because it doesn't come out until March the 22nd. Isn't that correct? Um, actually, March 9th was the release date, so it's out now. I got my 10, ten copies, and my uh, children have uh, ordered it. I've had a branch president who's uh, gotten it and has told me this isn't just for missionaries— this is for anyone serving in the church because it has examples on how to deal with differences. I take uh, missionary companionship as a for instance, where sometimes it works well and sometimes missionary companionships don't work as well. And so there's something called a companionship inventory in Preach My Gospel that by and large missionaries haven't used. So I've given practical examples where missionaries have used companionship inventories. And then I try to describe how this could be applied in other circumstances as well, in addition to a missionary companionship, how it might apply in any kind of interpersonal relationship where there's differences, or either where things are going okay and you'd like to make them better. I graduated in organizational behavior uh, and worked with Stephen Covey before he became famous, while he was still at the university. And we've often talked about how to take gospel principles that were somewhat universal and make them very practical. And over the course of, of my career, I've drawn upon that experience. Stephen Covey and I uh, often talked. He was always very generous to have a devotional or a fire in areas that I lived and a I'm grateful for that foundation that I share with him. Well, now, I tried to get a copy of the book. Of course, I went to Amazon, and it said not until the 22nd. So I haven't had the opportunity to actually look at the book. Um, uh, what chapters do you cover? So, it's again, it's available from Cedar Fort, the publisher, right now. Okay. Uh, and, and the chapters, uh, I'm just going to highlight them. The first one is, I hope they call me on a mission. And it's about getting ready and, and getting prepared. Uh, the second is those other skills. I talk about life skills. And I really talk about life skills throughout the book. Uh, shortly after the age change, the church did uh, a, a major research study, and they contacted probably a third of all mission presidents. And I was one they contacted uh, to... And they, and they were asking, how well are these 18-year-olds doing, especially compared to 19-year-olds? How are the 21-year-old uh, sisters with the age change doing uh, at, who are now 19? And I said, uh, spiritually, they're very well prepared. They've been 
by and large, they've been to seminary, some have been to institute. What many of them lack, however, are life skills, the ability to carry on a conversation. Um, as a, for instance, you know, today, everybody wants to text and to actually have a conversation is a challenge, a phone conversation, a sit down conversation. People would prefer, it seems, Facebook or Instagram, all of which have their their value, but they also have their limitations. And in particular, the art of conversation uh, is one of the things I said <coughs> to the researchers from the missionary committee that was lacking. Uh, other life skills from not getting uh, upset when things don't go your way and and you have to deal with a uh, big change of plans from today we've seen missionaries who came home as a result of the pandemic i actually have two grandsons who were serving one in puerto rico the other in the dominican republic who came home for almost two months, each of them. They called it a mission intermission. And then were reassigned to other missions, one to Arizona, the other to Chicago. Well, well those are pretty significant life changes, different expectations, and takes a certain amount of resilience to be able to adjust or roll through it easily. Some missionaries have done fairly well. Some haven't done as well. And that's a how to build personal resilience is an important skill that I both talk about and describe how it can be done. Uh, I talk about another chapter is how to make the most of study time, how to use interactive gospel study, not just to read, but to make the scriptures come alive in your life, and how to do that with a companion. When I talk to missionaries, both as a mission president and since I've been home, uh, I, I teach part-time at uh, BYU as a, an affiliate associate professor, and I, I've been able to teach at Institute as well. And most missionaries tell me their companion study was pretty limited. And so I've tried to describe how, as a for instance, in book clubs, people make a book come alive and apply that to companion study. Um, well, go ahead. Well, I'd like to stop right there <clears throat> because uh, this podcast is about studying the scriptures. And so what kind of advice are you giving the missionaries as far as uh, companion study? Yeah, so uh, it, a variety of different uh, things. I start with uh, looking at the word seek. Uh, seek is used, I'm going to say this from the top of my head, over 500 times in the scriptures. It's, it's often emphasized uh, even at general conference. And, and uh, so we begin studying the scriptures and understanding them first by, by seeking. And part of that means looking at parallel and uh, scriptures that are uh, similar, looking for ways to to uh, not just read the scriptures, but to link them to other scriptures, to other ideas. And one of the ways of doing that is by going to either the Bible dictionary or the topical guide. At one point, I asked missionaries not to read the scriptures, but to instead go to the topical guide, pick Pick a word or phrase that's important to you and read every scripture that's about it first. Second, write your impressions. Why, why was this useful for you? What did it mean? There's something about writing that creates precision, that forces us to uh, take our thoughts and to make them more timely and, and more relevant. And then look for ways to... Uh, apply that uh, scripture, that that we not just, uh, again, read or study, but we look to liken it, as Nephi said, to things that we're doing in our daily life. 
Related to that, Richard, is to ponder on the scriptures. Uh, ponder is, is really not a passive process. It's, it's active. It, it, it's, it's an emotional investment. And pondering is always uh, personal. It's not daydreaming or abstract or fanciful thinking. Uh, President uh, McKay said that pondering or meditation, if it's deep and continued reflection on a religious theme, enables us to pass through the veil into the presence of the Lord. We may not physically see or hear anything, but we'll be able to feel his presence if we make that pondering direct and, and purposeful. And, and then as a uh, final kind of aspect from a study point of view is, is to discover new, new ways, new words, new ideas, to not be limited by simply things that we've thought about before and, and, and applying them, but try to, to uh, look deeply at what the scriptures say and and anticipate that there's going to be new discoveries, new meanings we'll have. When I was a young missionary, uh, Elder Marion D. Hanks came to our mission, and he said every year he would go through the Book of Mormon and mark it and make notes uh, throughout it. And then at the end of the year, he would give it away to someone else, and he'd start the process again. And someone a missionary raised their hand and said, well, why did you do that? Aren't you going to be afraid that you'll forget your insights or or that you'll lose them? And he said, I, I want to make new discoveries every time I read the scriptures. I don't want to be held over by what was important to me last year or a previous year. I want it to be a brand new discovery each and every time. I, I love that idea. I encouraged missionaries to keep study journals, and then put them away and create a new study journal focused on topics, focused on uh, applications, uh, doing pondering by trying to make uh, an, an emotional investment in what you're reading, and then lastly, to discover the scriptures anew every time, every year, frequently. Well, now you've mentioned something. Um, I've interviewed a lot of people about their scripture study, and this keeps popping up again and again. Those who are very successful in their scripture study is the pondering and the writing. And of course, there, I think the writing comes before the pondering. But <clears throat> to be able to uh, write your impressions and then ponder these things over a few days or weeks or whatever it takes, and to... Um, uh, to be able to internalize it, which is the next part you talk about as far as action. Because it, it's it's the same thing when we attend um, priesthood meeting or sacrament meeting. We should walk away with something that we should be doing to change our life in a, uh, in a little bit way, to, um, to be able to, to just to be better, to move closer, line upon line toward being more Christ-like. And so, yeah, you're, you're bringing up these points that um, a lot of people are, are doing. They're, they're very strong points. Now, what other chapters, uh, topics do you have? I talk about, uh, as I mentioned, um, entry into the mission field as well as re-entry when you come back. And uh, that's a, a, a key part of what I think is important. Uh, I also talk about uh, how to, uh, in teaching, use uh, visual images more than we oftentimes do. Uh, teaching and learning, if you will, go together. And today, um, there's a lot of teaching that's occurring remotely. We're also discovering both how to do home-centered, church-supported instruction, and, and finding some of it works pretty well. Some of it doesn't always work very well. 
You know, our children more than anyone else see our flaws. And, and even today, uh, my children, sometimes when we talk, uh, and I'll, what from my point of view, think of as encouragement, they'll think of as, oh, you're telling me what to do, Dad. And they'll remind me, you know, you're not so perfect either. <laughs> and that's a challenge when parents teach, because we all want to elevate ourselves, yet we recognize our own weaknesses. I think it's the challenge of of writing a book, frankly, Richard, as well. You know, President Spencer W. Kimball, for the longest time, was reluctant to write Miracle Forgiveness, something that today millions of members of the church would say is perhaps one of the more influential books in their lives. And, and he just wouldn't do it. And he loved to quote, I think it was one of Job's critics, or it might have been Job, oh, that mine enemy had written a book and with an iron pen because he knew, uh, President Kimball, it, you know, these are aspirations, the things I'm writing about. I'm, I'm not perfect. I may not even be doing all these things all of the time that I'm telling other people to do. And in a home-centered church, that's even more magnified because it's our children whom we see every day or our grandchildren. Once a week, we have a Zoom meeting with our extended family. And, and I love it. For me, it's the highlight of my week to be able to connect with my children and grandchildren uh, over Zoom. I'll have to confess, Richard, it's not always the highlight of their week. So <laughs> sometimes to them, old grandpa's a little boring, and we rotate who's in charge of the discussion. We try not to make it a lesson so much as, all right, during the week, what did you read that, about uh, from Come Follow Me? And uh, what, what's, what seems particularly relevant to you? And, you know, sometimes the teenagers don't want to talk. Sometimes the younger kids will go off on a little bit of a tangent. And, uh, and I'll want to emphasize things that I've considered important. And I'll get a lot of, oh, dad, you know, enough of that. It, it's hard to, because our children see us so vulnerable so, um, so uh, uh, unvarnished that that's different from a teacher, you know, that's different even from a general authority. Um, President Hinckley apparently has said to new general authorities, people are going to listen to you as if you really know what you're talking about. And the biggest challenge you're going to have is... Uh, to not read your own newspaper clippings, to not not take the adulation that people have the respect for general authorities and somehow have that, in my vernacular, go to your head. You know, that, uh, th there, th distance has its advantages. And I think teaching in the church, teachers in the church, there's a real place for, because there is a certain distance, social distance is the term that's often time used. They're, they're not related generally, or at least not in the same way as parents. And so this ability to, to both have home-centered instruction and church-supported instruction, to have that work in tandem is, is the challenge of our age. And what a great blessing it is that we get to think about it, we get to experiment with it, we get to figure out how to apply it. Well, um, that it, it's very powerful, and as I'm reflecting upon what you were saying, uh, it's it's very very true. Now, as far as the scriptures as a mission president. What part did the scriptures play as a mission president? Now, it may seem like a strange question. Obviously, you're reading the scriptures and you're studying them. But what part did the scriptures play in helping you to do better as a mission president? 
So a little bit of background first. Um, as I mentioned, our missionaries came from three primary geographic regions, uh, the U.S., Africa, and Polynesian islands. And many of our African missionaries had less than three years experience in the church. They'd only been baptized members of the church for three years, and they had only been in one small branch. So while they, they may have come from an evangelical background where they knew something about uh, the Bible and more the Old Testament stories, they knew very little about the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and church history. And consequently, um, I often said to North American missionaries, you're teaching your companion as much as you are teaching your investigators. It, it, you need to see this as a both and, not an either or uh, approach. And consequently, uh, after being there a few months, I, I did two things that I think were really helpful. W one is I always put... Uh, North American and uh, African missionaries together whenever possible, and especially in an apartment. Sometimes we had two companionships in an apartment just because of cost of apartments and locations. And, and so I would use that as a way of promoting idea exchange. And, and there are a lot of cultural things that North Americans didn't know that African missionaries could share, and some church experiences that African missionaries lacked that North Americans. So there was a nice, everybody had something to share and could fill a gap for other missionaries. The second thing I did was to have apartment study, not just personal or companion study. And the third is I sought for and was given an exception by the missionary committee to be able to use uh, the Book of Mormon seminary and institute manuals for our study. So we had a supplement to the standard materials that missionaries are provided. And every week we would use either the seminary manual, and you know, the, these uh, seminary and institute manuals have enormous insights and day by day uh, study guides. So missionaries would not only read the same thing wherever they were across the mission so that there was a, if you will, a standardized curriculum. And as missionaries went from one apartment to another, they would be able to pick right up in another apartment the Book of Mormon study guide from seminary or institute. Uh, as a part of that, every Every uh, Thursday, I ask the missionaries that they would have uh, a a, an apartment discussion so that, again, they're sharing their experiences. And oftentimes this was uh, enlightening both scripturally and culturally. I tried to emphasize as well when I went to a particular branch and saw that a missionary was helping lead the singing, that um, the benefits of our learning primary songs and sharing them, because so many of our missionaries, so many of our African missionaries had never been to primary. They didn't know primary songs. My wife likes to say uh, primary songs are the gospel doctrine portion of primary. She's the primary president in our ward. And I, and I like that kind of phrase uh, and, and found that as we had added music and specifically primary songs to our scripture study, that it brought a spirit to that apartment discussion. Uh, it brought uh, insights and it enabled the discussion to, I, I think, be deeper and more satisfying than it otherwise would have been. I um, 
I've, I've never thought about that with the primary. I like what your what your wife said about that. Well, into the scriptures now that um, you're no longer a mission president. What what church calling do you have right now? I'm the priest quorum advisor and a stake called institute teacher. Oh, okay. And how do what is your daily habit now as far as the scriptures? What exactly do you do on a daily basis for you personally? Yeah, so um, my wife likes to have us listen to uh, the Book of Mormon or Come Follow Me while we're getting ready in the morning. Uh, so w- w- we were generally up by seven. Uh, her mother is on hospice and so um we one of the two of us will go every day to the assisted living center she's very close to us and uh will help feed her breakfast uh we'll come back and and exercise and we'll listen to uh the scriptures on tape Uh, in addition in the evening as we uh, review our day together, we'll talk about applications from things that we've heard during um, the broadcast that we listened to that morning. And because I have a fair amount of discretionary time, uh, Richard, I'll read the scriptures looking for things that I, I want to bring up in discussion in the priest quorum. I probably spend, uh, because I'm retired, uh, a fair amount of time thinking about Aaronic priesthood and thinking specifically how to have Aaronic priesthood discussion topics be uh, meaty and relevant and not superficial. Okay. And do you journal, or I mean, are are you writing things down daily, or what are you doing? I'm not a daily journal writer. My wife is, and she's got a uh, year's worth of daily journal entries. Um, I, I write more sporadically, and I try to write more stories or experiences. Um, I, I specifically tried to say, for children and grandchildren, what is it that might be most relevant and helpful for them? What what are the kind of experiences that I'm having? And because I care so deeply about the gospel and want it to be a part of their lives, I try to say, is there a nugget without overwhelming them that I can share? And try to do that with a different grandchild each day. I, I don't always do it each day. I try to do it each day. Well, now at your book, um, I'm going to ask you to bear your testimony to end. But before that, just one more time, your book is now available. And the title is What They Did Not Teach You at the MTC. Is that correct? What they don't. Oh, teach what they you don't teach they don't. you at the MTC, and I will put that in the program notes so people can have access to that. And um, so, what I'd like to do now is, if you wouldn't mind bearing your testimony. Sure, and I'm going to preface it by uh, saying, um, for the we currently have four grandsons on missions, and a young man that I write to regularly as well. And I've encouraged them in their testimonies to not just say what they believe, but to say why their beliefs are what they are. And and the easiest way to do that is to say because. So I'm going to share my testimony by saying I, I believe that by living and and applying the gospel, our lives become better because there's a blueprint in the scriptures for living. I believe that as we study the scriptures, that we can gain insights that we'll gain no other way. I 
I believe that as we attend church and participate in the ordinance of the sacrament, that we can have wounds on our soul healed and, and we can draw closer to God that can happen in no other way. I believe that as we personally try to live as the Savior lived and apply gospel principles in our lives, Lives, that we'll be shown how, how to improve our own lives without judging ourselves or without judging others. Because the Holy Ghost will be so available to us, and, so, uh, and, and we'll be so receptive to promptings of the Holy Ghost that our lives will be enriched regardless of our circumstance. And I share that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to the Busy Latter-day Saint, where righteous desires and living life come together. Here, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints discuss their challenges and successes in studying the scriptures. I'm your host, Richard Bernard. The music for this program is by Marvin Goldstein and used with his permission. If you have enjoyed this podcast, I encourage you to leave a comment regarding this episode or the podcast in general. To leave a comment, go to Love the Podcast. That's all one word, lovethepodcast.com forward slash BLDS, and that's B as in boy, BLDS. Or you can click on the link in the show notes. Today we hear from Dave Cook, a retired CPA who has done auditing for the business world and the church. He grew up in the church but became inactive and never served admission as a young man, but he more than made up for that in his later years. He and his wife have served three very different missions. You'll enjoy hearing about his life, becoming active in the church, and his new approach to studying the scriptures. Now, here is Dave. Well, Dave, good morning. How are you doing uh, this early morning? Ah, uh, wonderful. Good. It's great to be and going. Yes, yes, and we've got some nice weather. Uh, of course, I enjoy the snow, but uh, most people don't. So, <laughs> And we've, we have our time change here, which I certainly don't like, but um, not much I can do about that. So now, wh- where do you live? I live in Springville, Utah. Okay, and you're currently serving as a missionary. Yes, I serve uh, uh, Live at Home MLS Missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, In the last over a year and three months or so, uh, we accepted assignment to be senior assistants for um, the president for senior missionaries. So... We've kind of changed our assignment. A new elder and sister came into our stake to take over the responsibilities of the stake we were assigned. And we did keep some people we kept teaching. We still are teaching. Uh, but we haven't taken any new ones from our stake since we since the new couple came in. What do the senior missionaries do? What What are their responsibilities? Uh, primarily our responsibilities are to work with the stakes and wards and minister on steroids, basically, to members of the church who have been less active. We do after baptism lessons. We teach active members the family plan for Gathering Israel, which is um, a simple way to say that We try to teach members not to be afraid of missionary work, realizing they can be successful missionaries if they live a Christ-like life, are friendly, and invite somebody to do something, whether they join the church or not. Why do you think most members of the church are reluctant to do missionary work? Well, it does take a commitment, a commitment to our Savior and a commitment to being self-active or self-motivated 
we don't tell them. We teach them. We orientate them, I should say, senior missionaries. And then they go back and they have to implement whatever they're going to be doing for the mission. And it's amazing, though. We get to read all the highlights of our senior missionaries and then respond back to them. And honestly, you can see the Lord's hand in all of our senior missionaries. They get to touch lives. They get to change lives. Um, I don't know that there's anything more exciting to see somebody turning from a worldly way to a more holy way where they can start feeling the spirit. Uh, some of the people that we were, we've taught, when they hear the concept of tithing or they knew it, but they never really practiced it. And then they're finally willing because the spirit moves them to start paying tithing. They can't seem to wait to tell us that they'd had a miracle in their life because of tithing. And it, it just reaffirms the fact that the Lord is in the details of our lives. It appears that, um, uh, at least appears to me, that missionary work is kind of an attitude, and I think that's what you were referring to. I always think of my um, my father-in-law, uh, Serge Woodruff. Now, he passed uh, last year, 93 or 94. Um, but he was amazing to watch. Uh, he served as a mission president uh, back in Tennessee, Nashville area. But uh, I would go out with him, and he would just start conversations with people, total strangers. <laughs> and it, 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 he didn't start with, well, do you want to read the Book of Mormon, or <laughs> what do you know about the Mormons? Uh, he just started a conversation. Uh, but I would watch, and within three or four minutes— it was something about the church. And he just, I don't know, just made it look so natural to just move into that. Uh, he, We were walking out of a fast food uh, place one time, and he, um, a, a, an elderly gentleman was coming into the place, and uh, my father in law says, Hi, and how are you? And they started up a conversation for five minutes, and we learned that the, the man had just recently lost his wife, and he's widowed, and... Uh, and uh, discussion of the gospel began. Now, nothing came of it, but uh, I'm just amazed how easy he makes it look. It, and it is. Um, it is easier for some people than it is for others. I myself have never had a problem talking to anyone. Um, sometimes it turns out fantastic, but you can find so much information about people's lives if you just make one comment about what they're wearing like you see it saw i was hiking with my brother in arizona and i noticed a person had on their their t-shirt about breast cancer and i said oh are you involved in that and he said oh yes we are we are working like crazy to get more awareness out so we can help solve this problem. And by the time I'd left, I'd found out where they lived, what they were doing, and how many ch children they had, and why they were involved, because it had affected them uh, personally. It's amazing. And so in those conversations, you can express your love of God in some way without being overbearing or um, silly. You can just bear that you know that that like this this person who had cancer breast cancer the mother that was dying or died and you can bear your testimony the plan of salvation is pretty pretty amazing now with the covid um how has it changed with the senior missionaries as far as covid i know what the uh, younger missionaries are doing you see them on youtube and all of that but how are they senior missionaries handling it? Uh, some are really embracing it and have done very well with it. Some struggle a little bit with it. But we had two 90-year-old sisters that were serving. They had different companions. They were sister companions. But they not had very much experience with anything like smartphones and email and text. But they stepped up. 
and they were soon texting and emailing and um, Zooming their lessons over line and just doing what they did naturally, but using more technology. And how are they getting in touch with these uh, people? I, I guess the, the it's no longer inactive. They use a different term. What is it? Oh, less active. Yeah, less active. So well, we call them less active, but they're we actually call them friends. That's it. Yes. Yeah. There's a. I, I know that they changed the term there. Yes. So what what are they doing? Are they just um calling them up on the phone or what what exactly is going on um yes and about everything else they can do we can actually go into people's homes right now if our senior missionaries feel comfortable many of them have already had the vaccines so they're feeling a lot more uh confident they can go in a home for 20 minutes as long as they're masked up and that has really helped so some of the things are starting to go. Some missions don't do that, but ours has um, progressed to that point. It's been really well. It's gone really well. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Well, now what about you personally? You're obviously retired. What did you do for a living? I, I retired from a company called Clyde Companies, which is um, horizontal construction and supply, construction supply. Um, it was kind of a miracle. <laughs> it goes to um, a miracle when I say that, that why I could retire. I retired at 60. And it's because they offered an early retirement for some of the executives. And I was going to go in and turn it down. But something stopped me on the way because I'd been praying to go on a mission. I was attending an art class. Well, it wasn't really a class, a group of artists that we were drawing from a, a costumed model, various ethnic groups, etc. cetera. Um, and I was there, and the fellow that was one of the people who had taught at BYU for a long time was trying with us. He was going on a mission to France. And I said something like, well, that's probably not possible for me to go on a mission. My wife's very ill. There's not a lot that I'm going to be able to do about that. And he looked right at me and he said, oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, I guess I do have little faith. So with that, I started to pray. This would have been in uh, 2010. I started to pray to go on a mission, though I wouldn't recommend that you pray without your wife in the group <laughs> because I was praying this on my own personal prayers and then things started to happen um, a doctor that was helping her move her hips because she they'd atrophied from being bedridden from all the medicines she was taking he she'd been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis well as he was working with her hips, he said, I don't think you have rheumatoid arthritis. Will you go get rechecked? So she went back to her doctor, and they were very reluctant to do that and weren't exactly nice about it. And so she went to an internologist that was helping her with all the uh, damage that was done internally from medicines. And he, we got her off all the medicines, and... She was retested, and she didn't have rheumatoid arthritis, which allowed us. Now, did she – was it a miraculous healing of rheumatoid arthritis, or was it misdiagnosis? I didn't care at that point because it looked like we could now go on a mission. So I went to the Lord and says, well, okay, it looks like we're about to go on a mission. Or we can, thinking when I'm 66 or 67 years old. And everything would look good to, for us to go on this mission, you know, in six or seven years. Well, um, it's interesting that out of the blue, the company offered a, a early golden parachute for retirement. And I looked at that and I go, oh, 
I, I'm kind of unhappy with this. I'm going to go turn this down immediately. But on the way, I heard in my mind, I thought you'd said you'd go on a mission. And I stopped. I go, oh, okay. So I went in and accepted the early retirement and uh, was telling a friend of mine in a Boy Scout meeting. Um, we were at the council, and I was on the properties committee. And he was the fundraiser head of the committee, and I and he said, "Hey, the church needs financial auditors." I was a CPA by training, and. I was going to say, you know, don't turn my name into the church that I'm a financial guy. I want them to just decide where they send me and I'll go wherever they want. And I went to say, no, don't turn my name in. And I said, uh, yeah, go ahead, turn my name in. Within a week, the church had called us and said, um, would you be interested in serving as area auditors for Europe East area? Um I said yes. So we be, that was our first mission was to Russia. Well, Europe East area. So we ch- did extensive traveling while we were there because they wanted us to get out to the people, not the other way around. So I thought it was a mission sent from heaven for me. It's a great adventure. Uh, Sister Cook might have thought it a little bit more difficult. But she was able to get around. She was. Uh, she, she got. Um, she continually got better after she got off her medications, and had her whole health. And then I told her that I'd been praying to go on a mission, and there was this early retirement package. And I'd already gone and told my f- father, asked him what he thought. He was still alive at that time, and he, I, he was quite a good businessman and had a good sense for money. And I was expecting him to say are you crazy? You're making more than you've ever made. What are you doing? But instead he says, wow, that's wonderful. There's more to life than money. Go, go, go. So I had his blessing before I had my wife's blessing. (laughs) (laughs) That's not a good idea. But she was so good uh, in accepting that. But she did say, I'm finally feeling good so I can go get out with our family and everything. And now we're going to go to Russia? (laughs) (laughs) Well, now, you were there two years? Yeah, 23 months, yes. Okay, 23 months. And then you came home. Uh, When did you start serving uh, a mission locally? Well, when we came home, I actually went back to work as a consultant for a year. And Mm -hmm. then the church called us and asked us to serve uh, a service mission at the church office building as auditors so my wife and i went up and we audited for uh, she quit a little bit before three years but i stayed a full three years there that ended in april of 2018 and we were on this mission in december 2018. now what when you audit for the church uh, now I know what auditing is. <laughs> yeah. I know what a CPA is, but what are you, exactly you auditing when you're up at the church uh, in Salt Lake and you're an auditor? What, what what are you doing? Well, the missionary auditors, they just do domestic, well, typically domestic audits. I All I did was domestic audits for fast offerings. That's all I did. Sister Cook, she helped coordinate some of the uh, properties that the church owns. Their the audits were th- for the properties. She did some Canadian audits um, in fast offerings, and she did the FM or coordinated the FM, helped coordinate those things. Mm-hmm. So she had a little bit more variety than what, what I did. But uh, it's amazing you get to know some of the inner workings of the gospel and you see how many people are helped daily by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They don't talk a lot about fast offerings and how they're used, but I can say I stand all amazed at just how much goodness goes on 
because of our fast offerings. It was, it was amazing. That was your second mission, and so now you're on a third? Yes. Uh-huh. And again, just kind of review your third one. Well, we were, my wife was serving as Stake Relief Society president, and I was serving as um, the Stake Executive Secretary. And we were called into the new Stake president, to, and he was just trying to get to know us. And while he was talking to us, he says, I've had a few promptings about you two to serve a, ask you to serve a mission and to serve the, a local mission, serve in our state. And it's a full-time mission. You're called just like any other full-time missionary, missionary is. And Sister Cook lit up by like a candle because she thought that was the best thing, that she could serve and be home and not – she was – I think she was afraid that we might go back to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've we been serving, and it's been so rewarding. And wonderful working with senior missionaries. Our mission president that was over senior missionaries, is his name is Elder Blickens, or President Blickenstaff, he was called as an interim mission president because of the large number of young uh, adults. So basically, we have two mission presidents right now, President O'Riordan from Melbourne, Australia, and then President Blickenstaff as an interim mission president. And when that happened, um, we were asked to take a little bit more responsibility in the mission. So we're filling in for some of the things that President Blickenstaff did when he had time. <laughs> He's really busy now. Moving on to um, the scriptures here, what, um, how has the scriptures played within your life? Well, extremely important. Um, I did not serve a mission as a young man. I grew up in a very active family. But when we moved from Springville to Salt Lake City when I was 15, I had a real hard time fitting in. And there were some unkindnesses that were done that, made me quite bitter. So I stopped going to church and wouldn't read scriptures, wouldn't do anything, and I started to believe in some of the worldly philosophies of man. And uh, much to my parents' heartache, and at least one brother kept writing to me (laughs) to try to change my mind. Um, But I was pretty definite. I didn't want anything to do with the church. And I went completely inactive. Um, I found that I could get a lot of friends by not living the standards where I couldn't seem to get a friend at all, even in my own ward. Um, It seemed like I was almost being shunned. Very few people, if any, would talk to me at my own age. And so I I started looking at people as rather hypocritical that they said all this wonderful stuff in church, but they didn't practice any of it. Of course, when you're starting to get real negative feelings, you can see all the bad, if you want, into other people. Well, time went on. I married my sweet high school sweetheart. Um, she was from a, her mother had been a member, but it had her name removed. It was very anti-LDS uh, church. And her father was Southern Baptist, so we seemed to get along just fine with that family. Well, we moved to Hawaii, and my uncle was president of the college at that time, of Church College of Hawaii. And as we moved into a one-room house on the beach, uh, we were so poor, we didn't have much of anything. And within a few minutes, the bishopric came and visited with us. And then they left, and a half an hour later, the Elders Quorum Presidency came and visited with us. And then a little while later in the day, our visiting teacher and home teacher came to visit with us, a couple. And they said, well, we think that coming once a month isn't enough. We're going to have family home meeting every Sunday night with you. <laughs> So we were active before we realized what we were 
doing. And, of course, I didn't really have a testimony, and I was still looking at people in a negative way. Well, I got a little bit sick and couldn't go to work for a couple of days. And as I was laying there, I looked at the old Book of Mormon that I'd brought over that my father had given me for to go on a mission. And I looked at it and I said, okay, I'll give you another chance. Well, we are so poor. We didn't have any other books. We didn't have a TV. We didn't have a radio. Um, so I picked up the Book of Mormon and I read it in two days. I couldn't put it down. And I kept getting these wonderful feelings about that would come on. But I knew enough about the Book of Mormon. You weren't supposed to know this until Moroni 10 when it says, if after you've read these things, if it's going to be true. So I'd shut those down during those that two days of reading. And, of course, Sister Cook thought I was absolutely out of my head. And so Becky heads out, and she heads down the street. Uh, not the street, the beach. <laughs> she went on a walk on the beach. Just couldn't hardly take me what I was doing because I was just completely enthralled. I'm not sure I slept much during that time. Well, I knew you're supposed to go to like a closet or something to pray. And when you're away from the church a while, you have what I call spiritual amnesia. I forgot all the good feelings I'd had growing up in an active home. So I went to the closet and I said, okay, is this true? Now, I'd had these wonderful feelings going on, but I wasn't going to admit that that was the truth yet. So I knelt and I prayed. And for me, being a nervous fellow, I think I might have been in there five minutes, but it seemed like hours. And I kept asking, well, is this true? And then I'd wait and wait and wait and no answer. So finally I said, okay. I stepped out of the... the closet and I said well I guess it's not true and I was a bit disappointed because the book had really enthralled me um, then I also heard this in my head I told you four times already <laughs> so I said oh where did that come from you look around and whether they were thoughts or words I'm not sure but I said oh okay well, now scriptures have become all important. And I'm afraid that if I stop studying daily or if I stop following the prophets, telling us to read the Book of Mormon and all the other scriptures that I've read and continued to read, I might slip back again into those odd, odd times where life just seemed dark. It's also changed the way I looked at people. I never looked at people as hypocrites anymore in the church or anywhere. I saw people struggling. I saw people needing help, needing a lift, needing a friend, uh, wanting to be good, but often making poor choices. That's what I saw. There was no more hypocrisy. There was no more me complaining about anyone. Now, my mother-in-law still liked to point out every time a uh, member of the church did something bad and got in the paper, and she made sure I saw the article. Well, that didn't matter to me anymore. None of that did, because I had a, a true testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. I also later had a, as just powerful that this church is true, and it was just as powerful as the Book of Mormon testimony. So, yeah, is it perfect? Are people perfect? Absolutely not. And don't expect me to be. But certainly I saw wonder in people's eyes, struggling. But they were, they're loved. They are beloved children of our Heavenly Father with all their warts. And I think it just all dawned on me that these were the most wonderful people on earth. How do you... Um approach the scriptures on a daily basis what, what do you do well thanks to your class that has been a, quite an influence upon me i do use the gospel library quite extensively the note uh we do a lot of lesson preparations and i use all the notes 
I use tags and all those things that just help enrich the scriptures, particularly as I'm getting older and I don't have as much recall of the scriptures as I used to. But those are those are great tools. It it's like carrying a whole library around with you whenever you're you have a question or if you're teaching somebody a concept, some of these things can come to mind quite rapidly, which is what the Lord promises us promises that he will uh, go with us as we share his gospel, and he does. Now, are you doing that on an, a smartphone or an iPad, or what are you using? I use a smartphone, um, an iPhone. I've had an iPad, um, but when I was an executive secretary, I bought a convenient little PC and my iPad got too old. It wouldn't have the gospel library on it anymore. So I haven't replaced that. Though I think that your last class convinced me that I probably should replace that so yeah. I can have that split screen and and start comparing and being able to do some things in gospel library that I haven't been doing. Uh, but I download a lot of videos in our lessons and uh but I hold the iPhone while I'm giving the lesson because that's where the scriptures and the notes that I have for the lesson that I'm giving. And really, senior missionaries only teach concepts. We don't go like the young elders and sisters and have to teach a whole lesson in, a, in one sitting. Um, we were teaching after baptism lessons to one family, and uh, we were there for 13 months. Of course, it breaks your heart when they say, well, I think we need a break now, but uh, they become your family, your friends for eternity. Now, as a senior missionary, uh, do you have a schedule similar to the younger elders and sisters as far as getting up and uh, having scripture study in the morning, or what is your schedule? Well, one, I'm an early riser anyway, but no, we don't have those kind of rules. Uh, these are seasoned warriors, and they know what they're doing. All we have to do is tell them what the mission expects, and then the, most of them are off and running. Do you find, uh, is most of your scripture study done in the morning? I, I am a morning person, and yes, I, I do most all my studying. But now there's so much available to us. So I might be studying Come Follow Me in the morning, but then later in the evening, I might be listening to uh, Tyler and Taylor, which does a Come Follow Me or Don't Miss This. There are several that are really good. I even listen to Matthew Roberts from England, who does a Come Follow Me on a podcast. So there's, a, there's just so much available to us right now that it's almost – there's no time to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I discovered last night, um, it's, uh, it comes from the Book of Mormon Central, and I can't remember the woman's name. She's uh, a teacher at uh, BYU, I believe. But uh, she's talking about the Doctrine and Covenants, and of course, come follow me. Uh, I was enthralled. She is just so... In fact, she t one of these people that really talks fast, and she's just so excited about the whole thing. But uh, she puts on excellent presentations, and it's part of the, um, uh, let's see, is it the Scriptures Plus? I, I've got to look that I gotta look that up. Um, I'm looking it up now. Um, but Yeah, I have Scripture, Scriptures Plus yeah, online. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's the Scriptures Plus that is put out by the... Um, Book of Mormon Central, and um, she's on there. But I thought, boy, I'm going to. In fact, I listened to uh, this coming week, and I went back and listened to last week where she talked a lot about Emma S uh, Smith, and it was very, very interesting. And you're right, there is just there is so much available now that I'm convinced that there's no excuse for somebody staying on the covenant path. That um, we. we 
we've got these devices that have, we've been blessed with, and you can listen to a podcast. You can listen to, uh, and the church has several podcasts. Um, you can listen to music. You can listen to the scriptures. Sometimes when I'm driving, I'm listening to the scriptures. Uh, there is so much available to help us just stay focused and to let God prevail, as uh, President Nelson has asked us to um, to do. So, yeah, these devices are very, very helpful. And um, uh, a lot of the population, not just the, within the church, but a lot of the population use them for other things. But uh, there is just, you're absolutely right. Just the gospel library alone has so much um, information in there that you can listen to, you can watch. Uh, that um, it's it's absolutely uh, amazing when I'm doing the dishes or something like that. I'll either listen to a be listening to a podcast, um, or uh, just have the scriptures going or uh, some music or something. So it, it's absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing what we have within our hands. Oh, I do listen to podcasts too extensively, and so. You can do all kinds of things while you're listening to a podcast and you can be lifted spiritually while you're fixing a mechanical problem on your car or something. It's yes, pretty cool. Yes. And uh, I have on my phone um, in my music library, I've got um, Truman Matson's um, lectures on Joseph Smith and things like that. And you're right. I, I could be cleaning the house or doing laundry and listening to that and and it, it sometimes it just stops me and go, did I hear that right? I never heard that before. And it's just, um, it's, it's wonderful. And as you said, it's, it's very, very uplifting. Well, I'm grateful for the time with you. And you're the one that approached me and said you would like to, um, to be on the podcast. And for others that are listening, you're always welcome to contact me. And um, I'd be, I would love to uh, talk to you. And I'm um, just grateful for your time. I've enjoyed the time with you. And um, uh, wow, well, I, I didn't realize that you had served uh, three missions. That is really something. And that coming from someone who um, didn't want to serve as a young man. And uh, your story about becoming active. Um, how long were you in uh, Hawaii, by the way? Uh, we... We went the whole time there, four years. So I graduated with a accounting and business administration degrees. Okay. And uh, I, I've only been to Hawaii once. <laughs> and I didn't enjoy it that much. I, I'm not one for humid weather, uh, but uh, it's a beautiful place. It's absolutely gorgeous there. Well, love the ocean. I love the hiking in the mountains. Um, I did work long hours and went to school full time. And so um, you didn't enjoy what you would say like a like you're on a trip. You're actually there with your nose to the grindstone the whole time. Yes. Well, when you I've lived in another country uh, for four years and working. And so you, it's totally different than being a tourist. It's it's totally different. But at the same time, you get to know the real local flavor. Uh, true. Yeah, a lot of great people wherever you are. If yes, you find, looking right. Yes, absolutely. Well, I would like to end with you bearing your testimony. Would you be able to do that? I'd love to. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all important in my my life, and then you look at my family and how they've responded um, with the gospel in their lives it just kind of held this all together. It's wonderful when my kids get on these um, text, texting back and forth, even though they live quite a distance from each other. And it's, it's heaven on earth as they l still love each other. We, we still get together. We try to get together for family reunion and everyone goes out of their way to try to be there for the family reunion. And we're getting up there pretty good. I think we have, about 45 of us now with in-laws and grandchildren, some great-grandchildren. Um, so just the fact they still like to be together, I owe that to the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's not a selfish testimony. 
you can't have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ and not want to share it, not want to be a good Sunday school teacher or a good Relief Society president or whatever it may be that you're asked to do. I think our first calling in the church was to clean the sacrament trays. We wanted to serve because we knew things were true. And I'm grateful for my good companion who also came along. It took her a few more years before she had a testimony of the gospel. But when she did, it was all she was all in. The Spirit will continue, has continued to testify to us as we continue to study and learn and to have further light and knowledge come to us. When President Nelson asked us to hear him, I think the Spirit's almost here in more strength because we're seeing more people, even those who are just starting to clean up their act and start to come back. They're starting to feel that. They're starting to hear the good word of the Lord come to them personally to help them along the way. And I know this is true. Christ is our Redeemer. He is our hope and our advocate. He has restored his gospel on the, on the earth through Joseph Smith the prophet. And now we, are, we have a prophet, the head of this church. What a glorious thing. What an unprecedented thing to know that these things are true. And I see, say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Welcome to the busy Latter-day Saint, where righteous desires and living life come together. Here, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints discuss their challenges and successes in studying the scriptures. I'm your host, Richard Bernard. The music for this program is by Marvin Goldstein and used with his permission. If you have enjoyed this podcast, I encourage you to leave a comment regarding the episode or the podcast in general. To leave a comment, go to lovethepodcast.com forward slash B as in boy LDS. That's lovethepodcast, all one word, dot com forward slash B LDS. Or you can click on the link in the show notes. Carl Beckman, a retired investment banker, shares with us the challenges of managing all the cars in the Sydney, Australia mission and taking on the challenge given by his mission president when Carl and his wife completed their mission. The president asked him to follow the counsel of President Nelson to study everything about Jesus Christ found in the topical guide. After several months, he recently completed that challenge and shares how he used the gospel library to tie them all together. Carl also talks about his favorite hobby, studying the scriptures. And now, here's Carl. Carl, welcome this morning. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. Good. And how was your weekend? We had a good weekend. A little celebration, family celebration of a son's birthday, and it was fun. How old is he? He just turned 40. Just turned 40. So you don't have any young ones at home. <laughs> we do not. No, we're, uh, we're empty nesters and uh, uh, retired here in Kaysville, Utah. Oh, okay. And how long have you been retired? About four years. Four years. And what kind of work were you involved in? Uh, we lived in uh, Chicago for the last 25 years prior to moving here, but we were... I was involved in corporate investment banking out in uh, uh, the Chicago area with the bank there. 
Okay. Investment banking. What exactly do you do with investment banking? Uh, investment banking is primarily raising capital a lot of times in the uh, the professional and and uh, uh, and uh, private markets, but the public markets. Uh, you might be looking for high yield bonds. You might be looking for uh, other kinds of debt instruments. Uh, you can also look for equity uh, stocks uh, and raising stock. Uh, going to uh, the market to raise capital for your uh, company needs in, uh, in the equity market or in the uh, debt market. And what kind of educational background do you have to, to do that? I uh, came home from a mission and, and went to Utah State, uh, got a bachelor's degree in business there and then uh, wanted to uh, further that uh, specialty and I got a degree down at BYU, an MBA at BYU and, and an emphasis in accounting and finance. Okay. And how many children do you have? We have five children, uh, all grown and uh, married and uh, out of the nest right now. And so how many grandchildren does that give you? Uh, we have 19. Uh, if I get the count right, I think there's uh, 10 boys and 9 girls. Well, that, are they all here in Utah? No, no. We have uh, three in Utah. Uh, three of our children are, are in Utah. One is in Chicago, and uh, one is up in the uh, Portland area, in Beaverton, uh, Oregon. Okay. And you said you've been here in Utah, what, five years? Four years. Four years. We, we, we moved here uh, nearly four years ago after we retired, but we did spend uh, 18 months on a mission uh, uh, in that period uh, down in Sydney, Australia. Ah. And what did you do down there? We were assigned to the mission office. Uh, my wife uh, was the mission secretary, and I was uh, I worked with the fleet and transportation around the mission for all the missionaries. We had a relatively large mission, and so uh, uh, at the time, and then COVID trimmed that down. But uh, uh, we had a large number of missionaries when we first got down there, and uh, uh, that kind of vacillated up and down. So we had a lot of. Uh, missionary flow through the mission and activity that way. Now, you're responsible for transportation, so that that's the cars. How many cars were you responsible for? <laughs> the time I went down there, Richard, I had uh, the largest mission fleet in the church, 113 cars. Oh, my gosh. And uh, uh, we, as the missionaries got, it was a combination of two missions, the Sydney South and the Sydney North mission, and and they, in a merger, you have to do some rationalization. And so they, they brought the number of missionaries down and the fleet numbers down uh, over the period of time we were there. So you, had, you were responsible for any repairs and making sure maintenance was kept up? That was, uh, that was a piece of it. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, missionaries tend to have accidents. And uh, we got to do uh, a lot of work with the, the repair shops. We call them smash shops down in in Australia. And uh, and then uh, uh, there's a very high incident of uh, uh, traffic cameras there. So there was a lot of traffic tickets. Ah. Oh. <laughs> so what happens when a missionary gets a traffic ticket? They get a call from me. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do? <laughs> I assign it to them. <laughs> okay, so they have to... Now, there, do you just pay the fine, or do you have to go to court? They, they, have, to, they have to pay the fine, yes. They have to pay the fine. Were, yeah. they, were they pretty expensive? They are very expensive in, in Australia. Uh, in Australia dollars, they will range from 200 to $450, uh, depending on the incident. Oh, my gosh. Now, did there, you, after that high of an expense paying the first ticket, did, did you have missionaries that didn't learn their lesson and got more? 
Oh, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, they did. Oh, they, my. It was, it was always a challenge. And, uh, uh, some would, some would really take it seriously after the first, uh, uh, first one. But, uh, a lot of times they, uh, uh, they're learning. They were just learning how to work through that and manage that. And what traffic cameras are very, very, uh, prevalent down there. And so that's something you just really got to be careful about. Well, I can't imagine being a parent and having my son call me and tell me he's got four hundred dollar ticket that needs to be paid. Well, uh, and when it's two or three thousand dollars, sometimes it's oh, even worse. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, <laughs> yeah, it can be expensive. Oh wow! And as far as accidents with the cars, were there kind of a a common type accident? Maybe backing up, or they just didn't stop in time. What was the most common? Uh, there was a lot of that, a lot of parking issues. Uh, we were English style, so we were driving on the left side of the road and the right side of the car. And you take a young missionary, 18, 19 years old out of, of uh, the United States that has never even been on the left side of the road. Uh, and, uh, you put him in a car and, and he's got a learning curve and they really have to be careful. So, oh, wow. There, there are a lot of uh, opportunities, and and uh, it it most of them would have an accident, uh, but uh, you know we'd work through it with them. Yeah, and they were usually minor accidents. I mean, not a lot of them, yeah, most yeah. of it was uh, just little fender benders or yeah. or uh, backing or type of thing. But the missionaries, we, we really got them to take seriously the the uh, church mandate that uh, when the when you're backing up, your companion's out behind you. Right. Yeah, I, I see that here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see that they here. They were pretty serious about it. Yeah. And uh, your wife, now, did she stay at home and raise all the children, or did she also work outside the home? Uh, my wife, Elaine, is uh, was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, we kind of tried to make that decision early on. Her mother was, my mother was, and so we we tried to follow that model and—, and uh, uh, it it prov worked well for us. We were very, very happy to be able to do that. And how many years have you been married? Uh, coming up on 46. 46 years. Yeah. Wow. Coming up 46. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you. Well, uh, what hobbies do you have? What, what, what do you do when you're not um, taking care of grandchildren? <laughs> Uh, well, probably, uh, a scripture study is one. I do enjoy that. Uh, uh, I'm getting more into indexing here uh, while the, the temples are uh, semi-closed. And, uh, then I have a church calling. I'm a counselor in the elders quorum and, uh, uh, we, uh, that keeps us busy. So between the grandchildren and, and, uh, the various activities, we do some travel. We have been, uh, able to get out and do some travel, and we enjoy that. Well, now, what callings have you had in the church? Right now, you're, you said you're serving as in, in the Elders Quorum Presidency. What else have you done? Uh, let's see. In Chicago, uh, it was uh, I've taught Sunday school, gospel doctrine. I have uh, was the stake young men's president. I've been in a couple of stake presidencies, uh, served as a bishop, a high counselor, uh, uh, just a general, a lot of my callings were on the stake level and my wife's callings were consistently on the ward level. So, okay. Well, you said one of your hobbies is scriptures. What exactly do you do and how do you go about it? Uh, well, I, I've tried to develop, uh, Richard over the last, uh, you know, bunch of years, uh, a practice of reading first thing in the morning. Uh, I, I do like to do that. Uh, there are things I will, I do like to read at night, uh, but uh, getting into the scriptures in the morning uh, and uh, spending some time uh, uh, in that effort uh, has been very, very enjoyable for me.
uh, more recently uh, with the Come Follow Me uh, uh, lessons. I like to read those at the first of the week, uh, usually. Uh, and uh, I normally start out my scripture study with reading a couple of chapters out of the Book of Mormon and then get into something else that I'm of interest in, such as the uh, Come Follow Me lessons or other uh, studies that I've engaged in. And are you using um, um, hard copies of the scriptures, digital? Uh, you're on a desktop. What are you doing? Uh, I do. Uh, I, I've, I've evolved almost exclusively to uh, the digital copies on a tablet and have really enjoyed that uh, practice. Uh, prior to the gospel library becoming available, uh, I, I would go through and use paper copies of the scriptures. And I started, my, my scriptures were so vastly marked that uh, it was, it was and, and putting thoughts in and, and uh, adding quotes uh, that it became a little cumbersome. So I was, I was uh, prime territory for the digital scriptures when they came out uh, to be able to consolidate all that together. Now, you said a tablet. Is that an Android or um, Apple? I have a, a Samsung tablet. Okay. And uh, I, I, I have a Samsung phone that I use for teaching classes, so I'm able to experiment on there, but I have not been able to, um, I don't have a, a Samsung tablet, I have an Apple uh, iPad. Um, so I've got some questions for you. Uh, on the tablet with Samsung, are you able to split the screen? You can, yes. Okay. And you can split it more. Uh, on the iPad, I can split it in half, or 70-30 or 30-70. And then I can lay, they call them slides, but kind of windows over that. Can you do the same thing on the Samsung? I can split the screen. Uh, and I, th I think I can take it to uh, half and half up to 80-20 uh, uh, type of a thing. Uh, and uh, I do that uh, primarily when I'm uh, listening to general conference. I'll have a, a uh, uh, my OneNote up, uh, and I'll put my tablet into a little keyboard, and then I'll have a uh, I'll split the screen and have the scriptures, uh, the gospel library up on one side, and and the uh, uh, OneNote on the other side. Okay, and for those that don't know, OneNote is a um, is a um, a Windows uh, product that's very good, and um, so that's what you're using to get the text in. Do you use a, a a stylus at all on your tablet? I haven't. I have one, and it's available on this this particular version, but uh, I haven't used it quite as much, and so I'm not very proficient with it. Okay. And so you said listening to General Conference, you've got your scriptures up and you've got your note-taking ability up and it's all there either on a table or your lap. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, <clears throat> when you're studying the scriptures, then um, are you using a split screen so that the scriptures are on one side and you're taking notes on the other? Uh, at times, I have done that. Uh, uh, I do that a lot when I'm reading a, uh, uh, a book, uh, a doctrinal book from a general authority or other church scholars, and I'll have my scriptures up because I find that I, I want to, uh, a lot of those don't link uh, uh, between the Deseret Bookshelf and the Gospel Library, and so I will do a lot of copying out of the uh uh, book that I'm reading and paste into uh, my scriptures and uh, for notes or links or different things. Yeah, it would be nice if uh, Deseret Books, uh, well, in fact, all of them, <laughs> Deseret Books, Cedar Ford, if they, if there was a way to, if, well, if uh, if they would just make links available, I guess is what I'm point I'm getting to. Uh, I do the same thing as you do. I copy and paste. Um, in uh, where I can link, I link, but uh, it would sure be nice if I could um, 
take a link from something in Deseret Books and just put that link into the uh, into the notes in the Gospel Library. It would uh, sure make things a lot easier. And to be able to quickly switch over to that book rather than just have a copy of the paragraph would certainly be... Um, I, it's on my wish list. I don't know if uh, it'll ever happen, but uh, uh, it, would yeah. say it would certainly make things a lot easier. So uh, as far as books, then you read your books digitally. I do. Yeah, I've, I've uh, tried to move pretty exclusively to the digital books, too, because, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Deseret Bookshelf does have some very nice capabilities for marking and and uh, uh, tagging different things that I really like. Yes, yes, they do. I, I find it a great feature. If they would just add that linking, <laughs> it, yeah. would, it, it would be it, it would make it a wonderful, um, a wonderful combination uh, for for studying. Well, now you're um, you're making things into one note. Um, do you have a separate journal? What, what do you do as far as journaling? I have, I just use a word program, uh, and uh, I have a, uh, uh, just a running journal. Uh, it's just a, a regular word uh, document uh, that I've kept over the years. Okay. And um, do you back that up occasionally? I do. It, I've, I back everything into uh, uh, Microsoft OneDrive. Okay. So... Um... <clears throat> You've got your tablet, you've got it uh, split with the scriptures, and um, then you've got your one note, and then, um, oh, okay, I, I guess what I'm trying to picture here is things in the one note, does that make it over to the, um, the journal, or do you keep them separate? I've kept them separate, uh, primarily the, uh, if, if I uh, find something that I want to put into my journal, then I'll just uh, uh, go back and really uh, get the actual text off of the gospel library uh, of uh, the thoughts, uh, you know, the, the quote that I want, and then elaborate on that and pull that into my journal. Now, within the gospel library, um, are you using tags? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, I'm a prolific tagger. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm just curious, how many tags do you have now? Do you know? Uh, how do I count them? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've, got them I've got them here in front of me, I, but uh, I've, I've got maybe uh, 150. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's, that's quite a few. Now, uh, what about linking? Do you use the linking feature? I do. I do. I've, uh, that's been a... I, I really have enjoyed that, but I've come to appreciate that even more recently. Uh, Richard, one of the studies that our mission president challenged us to do just before we left was to follow President Nelson's example and read all of the topics in the topical guide under Jesus Christ. And my wife and I had just completed that study. And I found that while they were all linked under a subtopic of Jesus Christ, say the Son of Man, they weren't linked in the scriptures. And so I could take three or four of the references and I could link those together. And that has really enriched my gospel library study. Well, linking is a very powerful um very powerful within the gospel library. Now, what about notes within the gospel library? Uh, I use those uh, to put quotes in there, uh, particularly from from the books I purchase in the Deseret Bookshelf. Uh, I put my own notes in there of things, impressions, and uh, feelings that I have uh, about the uh, uh, all the. Uh, things that I've read, uh, I, I've used that quite a bit. And do you also use the notebook feature? Uh, I have uh, my, uh, I, I started using that in, uh, they actually they taught us that in the MTC, how to use that notebook feature. And uh, so 
we had an assignment every month on our mission in Australia to go out and speak. And uh, I started to make uh, different notes on topic, notebook uh, entries on topics. And then I would pull in all the quotes I could over the course of a month to prepare my talk for my raw materials. It was a wonderful feature, wonderful thing to do. Yes, it's uh, extremely powerful. And I, I've had people write to me and said they even use it um, for their meeting notes at church. So they actually, okay. yeah, they actually yeah. have a notebook called Ward Council or whatever their meetings they're having, and that's where they keep their, their notes. Yeah. Yeah, so the Gospel Library, they, it just keeps getting better and better, and um, does. I, I, like, I like what the developers are doing, and the, they just uh, keep working at it. Well, um, anything else about your scripture study that might be a little unusual or different? Uh, no, I think I'm just pretty, pretty standard. I, I've, I've got to, I know I need to go through and do some editing on some of these tags, and I, there's some point I'm going to have to do some cleanup uh, uh, of some things that just uh, don't aren't as meaningful anymore. And, but uh, but indeed uh, they are uh, they they have been rich to me in the past. So well, that's one problem with the Gospel Library is correcting tags. I mean, you can go in and correct a spelling or something. That's not a problem. But let's say you've got three tags that pretty much mean the same thing and you didn't realize yes. until later well <laughs> it's quite a process you've got to um, first of all find the tag that you want to keep and then you've got to go to all the the other two um, categories of tags you've got and move each of those over to the one you want to keep and then you got to go in and delete and it's <laughs> it's it's a long process and I wish they I guess that's another part of my wish list is that they made it easier to merge uh, uh, tags because that would be a great feature to be able to take three or four tags that you created over a period of time and just decided that that all could go into into one tag but um, we don't yeah. we don't have that yet so I guess I'll have to add that to my uh, my wish <laughs> my wish list. Well, one of the things, uh, Richard, that I did that that uh, has been uh, quite an interesting study is President Nelson at last General Conference invited us to uh, uh, mark those scriptures that pertain to the promises to Israel. Yes, uh, and so I made a tag. Uh, promises to Israel, and uh, uh, I I have been amazed at how many there are. I'm up to uh, 52 items mm. I've found that are promises to Israel. And another one I did is uh, uh, the prophet's promises to us. And it's just interesting. He he makes some promises to us. And I highlight those and, uh, with a tag. Uh, I'm reading a book now, and I think it's called God Shall Prevail, or God Will Prevail. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but this author um, talks about, uh, the whole book is about the, the Abrahamic Covenant. And he states that the Abrahamic Covenant and the uh, new and everlasting covenant are all the same. They're just for different eras or time or dispensations. But he points out that he says, you'll be surprised when you really start studying the um, Abrahamic covenant, how much it is mentioned in all of the scriptures. Mm. And the book really begins to point out that how much the temple in this covenant is, it's almost on every page. And it, the, the problem, he says, that people don't know what the what words actually um, are part of that covenant. So not understanding the covenant fully, when it's mentioned in another way, in another scripture, you don't think of it as the covenant, but it is. And so I found the book fascinating. It's, it's, it's well footnoted, and um, I will put it in my footnotes. But I, I have found the book absolutely fascinating that... Um, uh, that this what President Nelson is asking us to do is not a simple task. 
Uh, oh. it, 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 it's actually, it would take a few years, actually, I think, if you, you know, for most people that are working and, and have jobs and everything, it would take a few years. And I guess if you're retired and devoted your whole time to it, it might take six months or something. But uh, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. And I, I like your idea of, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going to start doing that. Uh, tagging um the abrahamic covenant is what i'll call it but um uh, yeah that's um very good well um our time is just about up here and um i always like to end with uh, my guests bearing their testimony so if you wouldn't mind would you be able to do that i'd be most happy to you know this uh study that i have just completed on the topical guide of of the savior uh, has been one of the most significant studies of my life. Uh, I have really come to love the Savior even more. To read all those topics and read all those references uh, has just been a wonderful experience. I, My testimony of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith, and what that brings to the table has just grown immensely. I, I just love these topics, and I'm so grateful for that we have today uh, a, a uh, set of gospel uh, uh, information like we have in this gospel library. It is a great blessing to us. It's been a great blessing in my life. Uh, we're, we're so grateful to live in this time when we have a living prophet uh, I know President Nelson is a prophet. I know this, the, the Quorum of the Twelve and First Presidency are prophets, seers, and revelators. Uh, the, the, the study of their words, the insights they have, uh, just bless our lives. I'm so very grateful for that. I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.